Hey guys, and uh, welcome to uh, worshiping with us this morning. This is a joint worship service between King's Cross Church and River of Grace Church. King's Cross is unfortunately our facility that we rent has had some plumbing issues that are uh, currently being fixed. So we are um, resident uh, aliens with you guys. We are being pilgrims uh, taken in by River of Grace to worship with you. So our team is here. This is Joy and Drew. Uh, We're grateful that they're able to lead worship with you guys and participate in our worship service together. Uh, We are a community of churches that are building around this basic idea of loving Jesus together. Uh, We do that uh, right now, virtually, (laughs) as we gather together right now, but we do that together because Jesus has loved us. He has pursued us, and he has brought us together to be a community of churches that love him together. So we're grateful that you would join us uh, at King's Cross. If you're a part of the Manchester area King's Cross Church, we have missional communities. Those are our small groups, and those meet on Sunday afternoon, Tuesday, and Thursday afternoons. If you're interested in that stuff, just send us a message on Facebook. We'd be glad to connect you with those. Um, If you're here at River of Grace, One thing to note is that, unfortunately, our Good on Lifting Times uh, ministry here, so for, I'm trying to explain multiple things at once, King's Cross folks, this is a community of folks that River of Grace serves here in the Concord area, and uh, right now the Good Uplifting Times community is, we've suspended uh, their participation on Sunday morning, so that means no meals and no minibus ministry for them, um, which is a a big blow for their community. Uh, They are those that Jesus loves and we care about. And so if you would like to connect with them, serve them, or support them in any way you can while they're not able to be with us on Sunday mornings, send a message to Mark Johnson and he will be glad to help you connect with them to support them during this time. Um, Just with the numbers rising and all that stuff in our area, it was the wisest and unfortunately sometimes the wisest decisions are sometimes the most painful ones. So before we move forward, let me just pray for them because we care about them as as a part of our life together in Jesus. Uh, Father, uh, we lift up our brothers and sisters in the Good Uplifting Times Bible study. As you have led them through knowing the word good in the Bible, we pray that they would experience your goodness, though we are separated from them at the moment. And would our hearts and our voices be able to communicate with them our love and affection. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, One thing I want to announce before we continue into our call to worship as a church is the uh, Christmas Eve fundraising, uh, what are we calling this, Uh, extravaganza project that we're doing as a church that we're calling together. Um, I I have on the spot, I I apologize to my elders, uh, I've made the executive decision that King's Cross is participating in this as well. Um, So we are looking to raise $15,000 for... um, Stephen uh, Samoa, uh, uh, Salamo, not, all right, Salamo, um, and they are a, a church planting family in Kenya. Kenya. Sorry, we're just doing the back and forth here. Um, and so what we do typically, both of our churches on Christmas Eve, we take up a fundraiser to support um, a ministry um, either in our area or a church planter or something like that. And so this is to support the, their family with $15,000, and what that will do is that will get them um, a house. So they are living in, like I believe, like a makeshift tent right now, and so that will be able to provide the bricks and all that stuff to be able to build a house and a well, which will then, um, as we love to we love to make the analogy with, provide the waters of life for their community. So not only will it literally pull water out of the ground, but because we're supporting a church planting family, it will be bringing more of Jesus to their church and their, their area. And so I would like to call you. We've, only, we've had about $500 come in. We are looking to get to $15,000 for our Christmas Eve offering. I would encourage you to consider giving towards this mission because regardless of COVID or whatever, God's on mission and we're a part of that. And we're grateful to give towards that. So that's our, call, that's our, um, our Christmas Eve thing. With that being said, I'm going to turn to our call to worship. And this is going to be our call to worship from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verses 9 to 11. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arms rule and his arm rules for him. Behold. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. 
He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. As we come into this Advent season anticipating the arrival of Jesus, guys, we feel very distraught, lacking rest, needing a little bit of some stability. And Advent is all about anticipating, looking for our king to crest over the hill. And this king who comes for us, who brings us rest, who brings us stability, who brings comfort into our lives is Jesus Christ himself. And his leadership is marked by tending, caring, supporting, and loving those who are weak and weary and broken by the world around us. And he leads us now in a singing of his goodness. So would you join us as we stand and sing about the goodness of our great King. will be 
this prayer aloud together. It should be on the screen. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of the everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, Joy and Drew, for leading us to Jesus in worship. And uh, yeah, 
so grateful for songs of worship and for those gifted with the uh, gifts of music. Some of you uh, might recognize Drew. He was a member of River of Grace Church. Yeah. And uh, we sent him packing. Um, no, we sent him, uh, we sent him down to help start King's Cross. And uh, we're just so grateful for he and uh, uh, just his commitment to the church. And Joy, thank you for leading us uh, and comp- accompanying last, last week. It's just been a, uh, a blessing. Uh, we're going to go to prayer first. Uh, we call this a pastoral prayer, um, which means as a pastor, uh, our, our job is to pray for you. One of my jobs is to pray, uh, and we want to be praying for our body. As was mentioned earlier, we want to be praying for our Good Uplifting Times community who uh, really, this was their, the best hour of their week, two hours of their week. And um, because we felt for their safety, they're the most vulnerable um, to, to suspend um, the minibus and a meal. Uh, it's just hard on them. Also, Bert, who hasn't been with us for several weeks anyway because the uh, group home they're in has been locked down. He is in the hospital um, and uh, with COVID-like symptoms, but the tests um, so far are not clear. We want to be praying for Bert and uh, his needs and then just for the uh, the strain that so many we have people in 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 so many fields affected by the strain of of the day and so whether it's the medical field education or just normal life uh, we all are feeling this strain of the day and then let's finally we'll remember to pray for the witness of the gospel Um, jesus said i will build my church and the gates of covid cannot stand against it so let's keep that in mind as we pray, as we live our lives. And uh, so would you bow your heads with me? Pray here, pray with us at home. You're our Father, and we run to you because Christ has opened the door. We need not be afraid of condemnation, of rejection, of a distracted Father. Thank you that, Father, you, your face is toward us. You love us. And you work in our prayers that in, in your divine sovereignty, all-powerful God, you choose to work in our prayers. And the more we pray, the more we see you at work. And uh, we, we confess we are often um, slow to pray. And I ask, Father, that you would continue to generate a, a maturity among us, that we are, are Father-dependent, that we would pray because of Christ through the Holy Spirit, confident that you love to hear your children put into words our desires here on earth and lord as we pray your prayers and 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 follow your instructions of seeking your kingdom here on earth lord we know that the gospel is to be proclaimed and the church is meant to be a place for the least of these and lord in our community our church family the the the, uh, the good uplifting times family have been to us Um, a treasure and it's been an honor to serve them these I don't know six seven eight years and Lord we long to see them blessed and loved well and father in this very difficult time of of uh, of of restrictions and and lockdowns uh, Lord I pray your special help to them most can't even tune into uh, watch um, online and so, Lord, I pray that, that uh, the promised hope of a vaccine would arrive quickly to New Hampshire and that these, our dear loved ones in, the, in, the, in good uplifting times, would, would be the first, among the first, to be the benefit of, of, um, of the vaccine, Lord. And uh, Father, for Bert in the hospital, we pray that you would sustain him and lift him up and heal him. And uh, Lord, I I just ask that you continue to watch over not just him, but others in our our body who are afflicted with illnesses, cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, uh, Lord, diabetes, and other uh, illnesses. We ask, Father, for your grace in their lives. Lord, as we pray for your church and its witness, I pray, Father, for the Salamos in in Kenya. Father, I pray that you would uh, bless them, send workers. Uh, Thank you that you have... um, advanced your gospel into this Rendeli people that the Salamos are planting among. 
Uh, people have just received the Bible in their language two years ago. And thank you for sending such a qualified couple. I pray, Father, for a house for them. I pray that we can raise the funds to build a house. I pray, Father, for a well for the community they live in, that they, during dry season, wouldn't have to walk those five or ten kilometers to get water. But most of all, Father, I pray that your gospel would change people's hearts from those who are lost and searching for meaning to those who know the Heavenly Father. Father, I pray for our own witness here in, in the uh, central New Hampshire region. I pray for King's Cross witness in Manchester. I pray for River Grace's witness in the Concord area. I pray, Father, for the new church plant in Henniker. I pray, Father, that many uh, residents of that town and, 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 and New England College would, would meet Jesus and, and, and discover the meaning of life and, and why you love a place like Henniker. And now, Lord, we open the Bible and ask that you would do what I cannot, that you would speak to us in deep places through your Holy Spirit. Thank you that the Word of God is alive. I pray that you would help those who are weary, that they would hear life-giving words. I pray for those who are stubborn, that you would break through the stubbornness. I pray for those, Father, um, who haven't yet believed or who have a false belief, that you would, you would lift the veils of their eyes they could see the beauty of the gospel in Christ and not in their own self-righteousness or their own prayers they prayed or the religious activities they've done but in Christ we are made alive so bless the preaching of your word we ask in Christ's name amen so we're in our advent series if we could summarize advent in one line listen to it carefully here's the line the line is Christ has come, Christ will come again, okay? So repeat that with me, okay? It's Christ has come, Christ will come again. Say that with me, we'll say it, let's say it three times together. Christ has come, Christ will come again. Again, Christ has come, Christ will come again. One more time. Christ has come, Christ will come again. This is why we talk about hope accomplished, because Advent is leading us into a reminder that Jesus has come, but that is just a, a, a foretaste of the ultimate satisfaction of hope, hope accomplished when Christ comes in all his glory. The story we're looking at this morning is from Luke chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 57 through the end of the chapter. And after 400 years of dark silence, God has spoken to his people and he shows up and speaks to a priest by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was serving in the uh, temple, and, and the angel Gabriel came to him and said, your, your wife is going to bear a son, and, and Zechariah and Elizabeth would, were childless and old. So this would be a miracle in and of itself. And they, their long life without a child, which we learned about last week, was hope depressed, was awakened with hope alive that they were going to bear a child. And, and this morning, as we, as we move from last week talking about hope awakened, this morning we want to talk about hope spreading. Hope spreads. Every Monday night we have a, a prayer meeting online at River of Grace. Last week we had 16 people on there. And this past Monday was exceptional in this regard. Uh, we, I, there was just more of an optimism in the, in, the, in the prayer time, at least I felt it. Part of it was Tom England was there. We'd been praying for Tom, who'd had a heart attack and had two heart procedures, and there he and Sue were a part of the prayer gathering. And that sort of created this optimism that God is answering prayers. And, and actually, we, we got talking for a bit about all the prayers that God had answered through uh, our time praying together uh, on Monday nights. And, and that's, that had a feeling like hope was spreading. You see, here's the big idea. Hope spreads because God keeps his promises. God made a promise to Elizabeth and Zechariah that they would have a son. And as we, as we unpack this context, we'll see that now this morning we read that the baby is actually born. And Elizabeth, the mom, survives this high-risk pregnancy. You know what those are in our day. Can you imagine in their day, a woman perhaps in her 60s, having a child 
and, 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 and she survived. And then Zechariah, because in the, in the temple when he met the angel Gabriel, was filled with doubt, and, and God in his, his sort of humor says, you know, I've been silent for 400 years, you're going to be silent for nine months. And he shut down Zechariah's voice, and coming out of this, Zechariah is going to be able to speak finally. And what happens there is hope spreads through all the community. That's, that's sort of the, the theme here. So we're looking at hope spreads, and because hope spreads, we will see three things. We will see courageous obedience, we will see a changed community, and we will see songs of salvation. So I'm going to begin by reading Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 64, as we talk about as hope spreads, it, we will see courageous obedience. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him the child Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made, made signs to his father, inquiring what he want, uh, wanted him to be called. Ironically, so he lost his mouth, but he probably was poor in hearing anyway. So they had to make signs to him about what he should be called. Evidently, that's, that's the deal. And, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth, Zacharias' mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. So here, here we have, last week we talked about hope revived, that, that hope awakened because God had made a promise. He, he had, had broken through the silence that often we feel. You feel like, where is God? How come, I, how come God's not answering my prayer? And sometimes it feels like God doesn't hear our prayers. And Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed for a child, and they got to the place where they kind of like had given up hope. And Zechariah um, and Elizabeth uh, conceived. Right after Zechariah's term of, of service in the uh, te uh, temple ended, probably a week long, um, they conceived. And it said Elizabeth um, conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, not because obviously in the first five months you hardly show, but she was pondering, is this God really at work in our lives? And she said, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me and takes away my reproach among the people. So what happened? So five months, we got some time things going on here, right? So for five months, she's silent. Next week, I think it's next week. No, maybe it's the last week of, of our Advent series. We'll talk about that in the sixth month. Elizabeth shows up, and uh, not Elizabeth, Mary shows up because the Holy Spirit's come to her, or Gabriel's come to her, and she's pregnant. Gabriel had announced to Zechariah uh, and, and Elizabeth that the child was not about them. And Zechariah realized this. This child wasn't about their longing for a baby. That was part of it. But what happened here is they, they came to realize that this child was about what God was doing on earth that God was spreading hope on earth. And that the naming of the child became this mini controversy about what this child was really about. I mean, everybody in the community was like thrilled. Finally, Zechariah and Elizabeth had their social security system. Okay, that was it. They, that they, they banked on kids caring for them in their older years. And they had no child, and maybe they had, would have some cousins or nieces or nephews who'd care for them. But not only would they have the joy of a child, but they, now they have someone who would care for them as they got older. But that's not what the story was about. It was bigger than that. It was about a broader story. And so when they brought Zech, uh, the baby to be uh, circumcised on day eight. The whole community says, oh, clearly this child's going to be called Zechariah. And I love what Elizabeth says. She says, no, 
His name will be called John. And it's in the emphatic. It wasn't just like, no, we think we like John better. That wasn't, it wasn't, she says, no, it's John. Which, by the way, means the Lord is gracious. The conversation goes on like, how can that be? Nobody around you is John. Where'd you get that name? What do you find it like? Is that like a, a new, is there a trend on uh, naming babies John in our community? Is it, you know, is it, is it peaking? No. And so they asked, they asked uh, Zechariah, and Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, which is kind of like a whack covered thing. And, and he doesn't just say, no, his, the name shall be child. It's almost like he, he went to a Yoda mo- mode. He went, he, he, he kind of said, if you follow the word order, it's kind of like, John is his name, or John, his name will be. He, it, John has put it, 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 he responds with the first word out of his mouth, was kind of like, John. That is his name. You see, in fallen human nature, we make this story about us, our baby, our house, our career, our vacation, our retirement. And and the reality is, that is how broken humanity is because the story is not about us. It's not about an old couple having a baby. Yes, that's God's mercy, that's a gift, but that is not where the period ends on the story. The story is about God's mercy upon people. And and my story and your story, it's not about my feelings, it's not about my reputation, it's not about my financial stability, it's about Christ. And one of the beautiful things of the gospel is when, when we come to understand that our story is about God's grace, then that liberates us from thinking our life is about my own security or my own health or whether I have a baby or five babies or, or whether I get married or I stay single or whether I have a good retirement or I barely get by. Our story is about his mercy. And when you wrap your life up in that, it liberates you from thinking somehow that your life is about you or the next baby you have is somehow like, like the most important thing. You see, Zechariah opened his mouth and he blessed God. Imagine what comes out of Zechariah's mouth. He doesn't go, woohoo, I'm finally a daddy. Yeah, I got a boy. All right. You know, that's how, that was, what comes out of his mouth is he's had nine months to ponder what, what God had said to him in the temple through Gabriel. What do you think it said when, what do you think Zechariah said when it says he blessed God? My guess would be that he rehearsed what Gabriel said in the temple nine months earlier when he said, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at at the birth of your baby for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I think that's what Jeremiah, I mean, uh, Zechariah said to the people. He said, listen, I am so glad to have a son, but God has called this child to declare that God is sending his Messiah who's going to restore people from their disobedience to fearing God. You see, Zechariah and Elizabeth had the courage to believe what God was doing in and through their child in their old age. Yes, he brought them joy and gladness, and yes, the whole community rejoiced about the birth of their baby, finally. But his life and your life and every child you have has a life on mission for Jesus, and that is what defines them. When we see... God at work, it causes us to, to, to in obedience and, and courage, say, my life is about what God has called me to do, not about what, what you think is happening in my life. And so the, the courageous obedience of Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, in a small thing, naming their child, but also in a big thing, they got to raise this child with no alcohol in that community that would, 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 that would be a normal part of the meal. So there was, there was a, a short-term like obedience, name the child, long-term obedience, raise him in a unique way, which was a, a sign of sacrifice 
for the sake of a cause, which, by the way, doesn't give a lot of reason for here. Why? Because this child's life is about a bigger cause than just making you, a couple, happy. It makes you happy, that's fine. But that's not its purpose, its ultimate mission. When we see our lives about something bigger than anything other than Jesus, when, when, we, see our li- I'm sorry, when we see our lives about Jesus, rather than just about getting married, having kids, getting a house, having a career, when we see our lives about that, it changes everything, and it causes us to have courage in obeying the teachings of Jesus. Because obedience in the teaching of Jesus costs us something. And so, as we close up this thought on, on, on as hope spreads, we will see courageous obedience. A couple things to walk away from here. Like baby John, like Zechariah, like Elizabeth, your life is about something far greater than your life. It's not about you, and then that's liberating. John's life was not about him. It was about the Messiah. A second thought is, if God grants you children, your child's life is about something far greater than her or his life. And as you teach them that, it will liberate them from being wrapped up in their own selfishness. And your courageous obedience is in direct proportion to how much you are hoping in Christ. Not that he just came, but he's coming again. And that everything in between is about what does he want from my life on mission. It's beautiful to be in a congregation where we have that being lived out, to have like the Sheards and DeLormes move from Minneapolis to Henniker to, to do, in the middle of COVID, to, to, to do out of obedience the will of God and attempt to establish a, a gospel community in that, in, in that town. It takes courageous obedience to make that move. It takes courageous obedience for you to be generous on a regular basis. I heard this lately and I, I, I just thought it was brilliant. About... Something is getting your tithe. Something is getting your first fruits. Something is getting your, your, um, your first and best. And the question is, is it Jesus or something else? I just thought it was brilliant. Because it takes courageous obedience to be generous, sacrificially. It takes courageous obedience that goes against what people expect, like naming a child John rather than Zechariah, showing up and gathering in church, Serving uh, the least of these, doing things that people don't expect, takes courageous obedience. It takes courageous obedience to raise children to realize their life is not about them. I often hear pe- people, you know, it's very popular to say, oh, I love you to the moon and back. Yeah, you can't even love your kid to church and back. Don't give me that. Why don't you love your kid to the moon maker and back? Don't waste your life on yourself. Those of you who are facing retirement, don't waste your life on your retirement. Look at, say, out of courageous obedience, how does Jesus want me to spend my retirement? Because if you have hope in Christ, it's going to spread, and it's going to give you courageous obedience to live differently. All right, that's sort of the first sermon. Second sermon, second point, all right? As we see hope spread, it will also change a community. I'm going to read verses 63 through, or uh, 66, I already read part of it, but listen to this. This is the community that Zechariah and Elizabeth lived among, and they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God, and fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Now, if you didn't hear the emphasis as I read that, five times in a unique way, Luke writes an account of how all these people talked all the time about all that God had done, and it spread throughout all the community. Five times that word all is used in that short little uh, uh, passage. 
And as we think about how God changes the community, they become aware of God at work. It says that they were in awe or wonder, the wonder of God. Last week, it was so encouraging to have Jennifer and Victoria stand here and join River of Grace Church. And we were again reminded that God is at work adding to his church. And I got thinking about Victoria specifically coming to Christ last December and how she had met her now husband at an AA meeting. And uh, going against all AA meetings, they start, or rules, they started dating, and that was, but regardless, okay. But a year ago, the fall, uh, I, I want to say November of 2018, so now we're talking two years ago, Neil came dragged into church by Iris, who'd come to Christ a couple years before that, and his parents have been praying, him, praying for him for years. His parents are believers, and he, he, was, he was a dealer. That was his profession. Well, on the side, he kind of like lays brick or something. But he, he, it was a shock that Neil came to Jesus. And I, you need to understand that a lot of people are going, I don't, uh, no, no, not him. Or they look at Victoria and go, oh, mm, not her. You see, as God spreads hope, a community is changed. And it brings awe to all of us. And it becomes the topic of conversation. All these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And, and I, I, I need to, I'm, I hope I'm waking up some of you to this. If you are not aware of how good you have it to see that Christ has come and Christ will come again, Jesus wants you to come and bring that cold heart to him and say, I am like hopeless, I'm living as a cynic, I, I am not in awe of what you are doing and what you are doing to save people. And just bring that openly to him and say, my heart is cold, and ask him to do a renewing work, a resurrecting work, a, an advent work. In fact, we, we'll end this topic that he brings light to dark places, including our cynical hearts. Because it ought to be the topic of our conversation that Jesus is saving people, including me. I love to tell people I came to Jesus as a little boy. It was a miracle that God would come to a little boy. And that, I, that w- the transforming work of God in old people or young people, it doesn't matter. It's still transformative. And he's still saving us. Still save, I, He's my hope in the morning. In the struggle with sin in this world and doubt and, and anxiety and, and weariness, Christ is our hope. And that spreads. And it shapes our outlook. In verse 66 it says, it ends, And all who heard them, these words about what happened with John throughout Judea, all who heard them laid them up in their hearts. You know what this means? It shaped their outlook. You see, when you and I ponder the work of God and what he is doing, it's transformative to how we see our lives. The hope we have in God keeps his promises reshaping our hearts. Remember, we said hope spreads because God keeps his promises. Hope isn't something I generate like jump up and down and sing the right songs. It's, it's, it's like it comes because we sing songs about his promises that are are true that have come true hope keeps uh, the hope we have keeps um, is I'm sorry the hope we have in God it's in him keeping his promises and this reshapes our heart and as I think it's Keller says we don't find Jesus useful we find him beautiful at the depths of our soul he He brings beauty to every tree and every snowflake and and every season of the year and every human being made in the image of God. He he transforms the way we look at life and even our affliction. We, We see him not just useful but beautiful because he transforms people. And so as... as hope spreads, we see it in a changed community. I love to go through some old pictures of baptisms. It just always kindles in my heart, God is at work. I love the fact that 
since we've been gathering on Saturdays, Julie Daly sits right here. In 2006, she came to Jesus, lost as lost can be, found Jesus. Jesus found her. I love seeing people use their gifts because it embodies in us this idea that God has called us to be a different community of hope. Another sad factor of shutting down Good Uplifting Times is Tom and Iris and Mark who came alive serving that community. Suddenly their, their means of service have been sort of reshifted and, and taken away, at least temporarily. I remember baptizing Iris and just watching her have this massive heart for the least of these. You may be in a long, barren season of life, like Zechariah and Elizabeth. And God may be calling you to endure with hope, but God is at work. Let me recommend, read some biographies of some Christians who have endured. Um, yeah, Corey Temblin, what's the name of the book? Uh, Hiding Place. One, yeah, read that one. Now, read, read some of the stories of faithful people who've endured and let those stories kindle in your heart a sense of hope that God is at work. And don't give up on people. Some of you have been praying for relatives for years. My brother Butch grew up in a Christian home, came to Christ as a young boy, and his mother died when he was 11 years old. My dad married my mom, who... Um, nine months later, my brother Butch struggled with his faith, basically abandoned Christ, wandered away, and my dad loved on him and prayed for him, stayed in his life, and at the age of 52, he comes back to Jesus. And as I preached over, spoke over, had a part in, oh, did I have a, yeah, in his uh, funeral two years ago, Butch. I, the transformative power in his life, and then in his wife's life, and then in, 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 in the generations of, of their kids, grandkids, and, and great-grandkids has been just amazing. Don't give up the sense that God is transforming a community and a, a community will be changed as hope spreads. And finally, if we, as hope spreads, as it did through Zechariah and Elizabeth and into their community, we can expect songs of salvation so I'm going to read the last part here. And, and Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now, it's, it says prophesied, but this is probably it became a song. So I'm going to read it, but think of it as, as lyrics of a song. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our fathers Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. And you, child, talking about John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His way, to give knowledge of salvation to His people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Who knew Zechariah was a prophet? I, I, I thought, I, I debated about whether to call this, you know, when we, when we give little points in this sermon, that's not like inspired. So like, you know, like just because we, we're saying that hope spreads and therefore we could expect songs of salvation. I, I, I debated about saying that or saying, or salvation is proclaimed. Either way is, is, is correct. Ze Zechariah prophesied, the word prophesied is proclaimed. And what do we know about God and salvation from what he said? The whole theme is salvation or deliverance. By the way, if you're wrestling with faith or considering Christianity, you are relying on something to save you. Uh, in our world, it's government or education, or money. Like, if I only won the, the megabucks, I would be happy. That would save me. 
Or in the grand scheme of things, you think, many think, in our culture, well, I'm good. If there is a heaven, there is a God, I'm good. I'm not like bad, like fill in the blank. But what we see here is a theme that God has come to save sinners. And uh, as I think one uh, author said, the only thing Christians have better or up on those who are not Christians is we know we are sinners. It's the only difference. When that, that, that's, that's the enlightening that we need a Savior. And then, of course, Christ is that answer because we can't save ourselves. And so as we look at, 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 at uh, Zechariah's, Zechariah's prophecy or as a song, it's a song of salvation. Think of the themes here. God visits his people. At Christmas, we call that the name of Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God among us. God with us. God redeems his people now, I don't think Zechariah had any idea how that would happen on the, on the cross. And uh, even though Mary had visited and there was all that stuff going on and little baby John in the womb danced in the Holy Spirit in the womb, I mean, I, I don't know that Zechariah had any idea that Messiah was going to be crucified. But he came to redeem or buy back his people. Now we, post-crucifixion, uh, understand that purchase was in, in, in uh, the great cost of God offering His Son in our place to take the wrath of God in our place so that we could be freed from the guilt and shame and, and judgment due. Another theme here is God will give us a deliverer from the promise made to David. So David comes up in here. King David, if you don't know the Bible, a promise was made to him. On his throne would sit a, a king forever and ever and ever and ever. God will fulfill his covenant he made to Abraham. It talks about it keep God keeping his covenants, his promises. His promise to Abraham was that through you, Abraham, another old couple who had not had a kid, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. We as a church are taking an offering uh, Christmas to support the Salamus who are planning a church among Rindeli that do not have a gospel church in their, in their tongue, in that, in that tribe. God made a promise to Abraham that through him, all the nations of the earth, all the ethnic groups of the earth, the Rindelis of the world, would, would be blessed by the gospel. God saves us to serve him without fear. The love of Christ casts out fear. These are the themes of this song. That holiness and righteousness, that, that we can serve with full devotion and integrity. That's what it looks like, holiness and righteousness, full devotion and integrity. We don't have to cut corners. We can live with integrity, openness, transparency, humility. John would be a messenger of this Jesus coming. John's message was one of salvation and forgiveness. God's mercy is like, and I love the, how this song ends. It goes through all this sort of, historic theology of the Old Testament and ends with a picture, an artist's rendition of what it's like for the Messiah to come. God's mercy is like the sunrise, bringing peace and direction to those who live in darkness. That's how that verse ends. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And again, you kind of hear these, like the shadow of death that comes from, um, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23. That, that that this one has come to bring light to this dark world. Like, how will you die? Will you die in the hope of the gospel? How will you get through cancer or a divorce or your kids wandering away or all the disappointments this world will offer? How do you get through that darkness? The light of the Messiah has come. And he doesn't promise to change any of that. He promises to be your deliverer. And so how do we end? Well, as we think about this song, and we think about this song being about salvation and about our Savior, perhaps as we sing songs, I find myself when I'm singing songs and the words are on the screen and my heart doesn't match the words on the screen, it calls me to repent that I have a slumbering heart or I have a callous heart or I have a bitter heart 
or I've fallen into a shallow heart that's transactional, like, God, I will be happy if you do this for me. Well, God has done everything I need is in Christ. Therefore, that, that, that's my reason. So there's, there's a need as we sing these songs, perhaps, just to be using them as a means of confessing. When I confess, I'm being honest with Jesus. Jesus is able to lift the shame and the guilt of that and, and liberate us from that. And to li- liberate us from fearful hearts. So... As hope spreads, we can sing, we can expect songs of salvation. We can expect salvation to be declared. We can expect God to be at work and, and, and even in our own lives, delivering us from the dark shadows that haunt us. Songs of deliverance. Listen, we don't follow Jesus because God gives babies to old people. He can and he has, but that's not why we follow him. That's an easy thing for the Almighty to do. God makes promises and keeps them. And those promises to Abraham are to bless the world. The promise to David is to rule the world forever in peace. And we follow him because he's answered those promises. He has fulfilled those promises in Jesus. And he is blessing every nation of the world through Jesus. And he will rule this world with peace. And he has redeemed us. And he's forgiven us. And he's shown us the light in the dark world we live in so that we have peace. Hope is spreading. It has not stopped spreading since John the Baptist. Communities are being transformed. Some slow, some fast. With songs of deliverance as, as, as salvation is proclaimed in Christ. So friends, as we began, we will conclude with this this thought of hope. Christ has come. Christ will come again. And as it says in Isaiah, the Lord says, those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Let's rest on that. Thank you, Lord, that hope is spreading. Thank you for this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Thank you how, Lord, they had the courage to obey you, name their child, not serve him alcohol, and proclaim to their community this child was about a message of a coming Messiah. That that this child's life was bigger than its own life. Thank you for that courageous obedience which inspires us, Lord, to be obedient and courageous in, in following you. Lord, thank you. Thank you that as hope spreads, Lord Jesus, communities are changed. Thank you for how you have changed people in this room, how you are still changing people, how you're still calling people to yourself. And Lord, I pray that you continue to allow us to see hope spread as more people receive Jesus and grow in their faith. And thank you, Lord, that hope spreads as we sing songs of salvation and proclaim this message of salvation, that God, you are the God who keeps promises to Abraham and to David, that you would bless all the nations of the world through one who would reign with with, uh, peace and who would redeem us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you fulfill this. And we confess, Lord, that we get get bogged down, we get doubtful about, about all this. But, Lord, you say that those who hope in you will not be disappointed. And so, Lord Jesus, we declare not only have you come, but you will come again. And in that, we declare this morning, we have hope in you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this light to our darkness. In Christ's name, amen. I'm not finding an easy transition from that message on hope to this, except he said, we are declaring his death over us until he comes back. So part of us taking communion is a reminder that Sunday we will feast with the King, our Savior, the Messiah, your big brother. He calls you sisters and brothers. And so, those who are in Christ, we urge you at home or here, if you're in Christ, to participate in this reminder, to proclaim to your own souls, to each other, to be reminded that Christ has come into our lives, to declare to us 
his death that makes us right with the Father as we wait for him to come back when we'll no longer take communion and just get a, 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 a taste, but we will feast with the king. Jesus said, eat this in remembrance of me. That they take out the little wafer. You might even want to break it to remind you that our sins have broke the body of Christ. And he said, eat this to remember that I died for you. And the cup, the grape juice we have in this little container, is just a sip of that which will be a feast and a celebration and an unending place of joy when King Jesus sits us at the table and when all the struggles are over and we are there forever. He has redeemed us by his blood. His blood has secured that, not your obedience, not church membership, not whether you made it. His blood has secured your salvation. And if that is your hope, if that is your proclamation, drink this in remembrance of him. So Lord Jesus, in obedience to you, we eat the bread and drink the cup, declaring your death until you come. Christ, you have come once. Christ, you will come again. In this, we have hope. Amen.
Receive this as our benediction. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we declared at the beginning, Christ has come. Christ will come again. May we be a community that holds us up in the darkness to strengthen our hope in our King who came and our King who is coming again. May you walk in the goodness of this King who has come and is coming again in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week, guys. Thank you.